Hi, and welcome to the Vocal Fries podcast, the podcast about linguistic discrimination. I'm Megan Figueroa. And I'm Carrie Gillen. Today we're talking about language to do with Halloween-y things, scary things, and so not really about linguistic discrimination this time. No, it's it's really not. Although uh, some of the things that I want to talk about uh, bring up like the patriarchy and feminism, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't escape that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Even with our like folklores and stuff, it's it's in there. <laughs> it's Yeah, this stuff is really old. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's hard to fight. It is. <laughs> All right, so the first one we're going to talk about is the fear of the number 13, or believing that 13 is an unlucky number. Mm-hmm. And this has a name, and I'm going to pronounce it terribly, and I apologize, but... <laughs> Triskai decaphobia. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, Do you know Greek? I don't know. <laughs> Although I guess it is still just an English word. Right? <laughs> but anyway, so it means 3 and 10 fear, literally. Uh, so yeah, the fear of 13. And so why, what's, what's going on with 13? Why is it so unlucky, supposedly? Well, um, <laughs> it seems that there's some really old reasons for it. It might be the case that it was the stain for the number because it's positioned after 12, uh, which is considered to be a complete number by neuro- n- neurologists. By, <laughs> by numerologists. <laughs> You're very different oh kind of people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they are so different. I don't know how neurologists feel about the number 12. <laughs> I'm sure they're very neutral about it for the most part. <laughs> Uh, but okay so this completeness of 12 so like 12 months in a year 12 signs of the zodiac 12 gods of olympus 12 labors of hercules labors of hercules oh you don't know the labors of hercules no i don't uh, oh <laughs> but, uh, that's a fun story i mean he has to go do all these things i don't remember why i guess zeus told him to do these things like i don't know i don't even remember what they were that's so silly but hercules had to go perform like manual labor type things <laughs> to prove his godness or something or is well, he, he's a demigod he's half god oh, okay. half human i don't okay. i don't remember why he had to do it but yeah 12 labors of hercules okay that must not have been in the cartoon version wasn't it <laughs> i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> okay I, I don't know either okay i assumed it was because it's a huge part of his story uh probably is. okay <laughs> and then the 12 tribes of israel and the 12 apostles of jesus so. Although there were actually 13, which is mm-hmm. the... <laughs> yeah, so m- maybe one of the reasons why 13 is considered to be unlucky is because the 13th apostle, Judas, mm-hmm. supposedly turned against Jesus. Although there is also a possibility that actually Judas and Jesus were in on it together. Oh. So apparently they found a new gospel like 10 years ago and... In that version, Judas and, and Jesus come up with this plan together, kind of like Dumbledore, you know, dies yeah. on purpose. Oh my gosh, this is a telenovela. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And spoiler alert, Dumbledore dies. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just yeah. assume people know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh. Another version of mm-hmm. this idea that the 13th person showing up is bad is a story of uh, Loki. So the 12 gods were having a dinner party in Valhalla, and then Loki shows up, and mm-hmm. Loki's the god of mischief. Or Tom Hiddleston. <laughs> Swoon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so he shows up, and he arranges for the blind god Hodor to shoot and kill Baldur, who is the god of joy and gladness. And so when the god of joy and gladness dies, things get bad, right? So the whole do- earth gets dark, and everyone mourns. So that's another instance of the 13th person being bad luck or a bad person. Yeah. And another one is in ancient Rome, which is reportedly gathered in groups of 12, which, you know, if I were a witch, I don't think I know 11 other people. But So my, <laughs> my witch group wouldn't be that big. Um, so the 13th uh, person was believed to be the devil. So. Right. <laughs> which is kind of awesome. The 13th person that. I isn't i mean i guess it isn't there corporally i'm not really sure yeah or just shows up later yeah I yeah i don't know how that works do they know they're the devil or they suddenly become the devil what, what is the no, no, the no, devil no, no, summoned they're, yeah there are 12 people there and then the 13th presence would be the devil that's how i understand oh uh, okay assuming that witches summon the devil yeah probably yeah Okay. Or the devil just yeah. shows up anytime 12 witches get together because they're so evil. I don't know. Well, if the devil were a male, he wouldn't like 12 women gathering in one place. That's like a... Well, 
<laughs> I mean, if you think if you think witches are evil, if you think women are evil, then of course the devil's yeah. gonna like them. <laughs> oh, that's a really good point, <laughs> and not the point I want to make. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> And so this fear of 13 kind of shows up in all different weird places. Like architects still to this day, well, not all of them, but some of them still refuse to refuse to design buildings that have 13 stairs. They've got to make sure that there's 12 or 14 instead or buildings that have a 13th floor. So apparently more than 80 percent, I don't know if this means North America worldwide or what, but more than 80 percent of buildings skip 13 if they're that tall. I've noticed this and I just, I don't know if I'm just being a bitch about it, but I'm like, uh, then 14 becomes 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense to me at all either. And in Vancouver, it's even worse because they skip four and 24 and 14 because in Cantonese, the words for those sound like the word for death or some version of death. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. there's a lot of missing floors in some of the high rises in Vancouver. But that makes more sense to me. Why? <laughs> Because the, the, the word for it sounds like a thing. So the word not being there. Okay. You know, it's it seems better than like saying, oh, we're just, we don't have the 13th floor. No, but you really <laughs> Yeah, do. but you still have the 14th okay, floor. Okay. Like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it's not written anywhere. I don't know. But you're right. That's the same point of having 13 yes. written because people are afraid of the number 13. <laughs> ah! All right, fine. Nothing makes sense. <laughs> I'm going to say, I would totally stay on the 13th floor. Yeah, me too. I mean, <laughs> I, I've been in the 13th row, row in an airplane, and I hate flying. I don't think that you're more likely to die. I mean, if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong with the whole plane. <laughs> this is true. Unless you're in the movie Final Destination. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I can refuse <laughs> to watch those kinds of movies. Oh, okay. <laughs> And apparently also in France, um, back in the day, I don't know exactly when, but socialites known as the 14ers or Quatorisien, uh, once made themselves available as the 14th guests, just in case there were only 13 guests. Wow. Just to make it unli- less unlucky, <laughs> which I find so bizarre. That's amazing. <laughs> so these people, they were just random people that would serve as this 14er. Yeah, the 14th guests. Oh, <laughs> ah, yeah. wow. Okay. <laughs> It actually sounds like a good gig. I know. I mean, they got paid in food at least. Yeah, food and drink probably. Yeah. So um, with that being said, we just survived a Friday the 13th. Ooh. <laughs> and, and it was in October. Yeah, so, double whammy. Yeah. And there is even more hellish things happening, right? <laughs> Yes, the the la- the very last flight of flight six 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 to hell was on the Friday the thirteenth last week. I'm actually surprised that they used that number as a flight. Yeah, I'm sort of surprised too. Although I guess not everybody is as freaked out by the number six six six. But I guess that's Judeo Christian stuff, right? Yes, it comes from Revelations, the mark of the beast. The fear of Friday the 13th has a, has a word as well, and it's Frigga Triskai Decaphobia, and I know I did that <laughs> badly. So Frigga, or Frigg, is, the god, is a uh, Norse goddess, which we name Friday after, and then three and ten fear. So it's basically the fear of Friday the 13th. And uh, it doesn't help that uh, Jesus was supposedly crucified on a Friday. Right. And then... Like you mentioned earlier, Judas was the 13th apostle that supposedly uh, stabbed him in the back. Right. Oh, and then uh, this is something I didn't know. I learned so much on our podcast. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So Eve supposedly tempted Adam on a Friday and Cain supposedly killed his brother Abel on Friday the 13th. I don't know how they know that. I don't know how this is. I mean, this is probably determined by like biblical scholars who really like dig deep. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, how do they know it was a Friday? Was there such a time yeah i don't know well i guess there was because you know god supposedly built the world in six seven six days so i guess they knew what day it was i don't know (laughs) it also could just be like a a back formation kind of thing where people are like we hate this day so i don't know i don't know where it came from yeah i don't know either i mean there's also the the uh, supposedly friday was the day when most people were hung or hanged whichever version you use i use hung (laughs) 
And so Friday was known as Hangman's Day, so that's another reason why Friday can be kind of a bad bad luck day. Oh. And the 13th actually falls on Friday more often than any day of the week, apparently. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. Isn't that, isn't that weird? But, yeah. That's super weird. In any given year, you can have one Friday the 13th, or you can have up to three Friday the 13th. So we always have one Friday the 13th? Every year, yeah, at least. Okay. And some years are particularly, uh, quote unquote, unlucky by having three. And people really take this seriously. Like, yeah. apparently, 800 to $900 million is lost in business on Friday the 13th wow. because people stop flying, they stop doing business. See, I would be the business woman who like swoops in and steals business on Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> That's bonkers. Okay. I agree. I shouldn't call it bonkers because there are some things I believe in that are ridiculous. <laughs> we all believe in at least one thing that is completely false. Yeah. <laughs> and is obviously false, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, so, uh, people who consider themselves unfortunate are more likely to believe in superstitions associated with bad luck. So, if you don't believe in superstitions, wait, if you don't believe in luck, right, then right. you can't have bad luck or you won't believe in a magical force that is trying to ruin your life. Right. So. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a good idea just to not worry I mean, about it. We're not trying to tell you how you live your lives except when it comes to language. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, just might make your life a little bit easier if you're (laughs) not superstitious, but you you do you. (laughs) Okay, so the Friday the 13th thing brought up the, we we talked about the Flight 666. So there's also a word of the fear of the number 666. (laughs) I don't even know if I want to try and say this. Hexic. Hexacosioi, hexaconta, hexaphobia? I don't know. <laughs> it's the fear of the number 666. And this comes from the number of the beast, which is in the book of Revelation from the New Testament. And it's in chapters 13. <laughs> <laughs> I am telling you. Okay. And weirdly, I didn't know this until I did the re- research of this because this is something I didn't grow up with. I don't know that much about this stuff, but apparently... Some in some sources, the number of the beast is actually six one six. Oh, so we have a new number to be afraid of. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just add it to the list. Right. <laughs> and apparently, this comes well. There are a d- bunch of different theories, but the theory that made the most sense to me is um, apparently the name and title of Nero, the Roman emperor, so Nero Caesar. Mm-hmm. The numerical interpretation of that is six six six. If you um, do it through the what do you call it? The Hebrew numerology. Mm-hmm. So it was like this way, this coded way of talking about Nero without the Roman author- authorities knowing. And why wouldn't they wanted the Roman authorities to know? In modern day time, people talking about Trump, but not wanting, say, Trump to know that they're talking about him. Oh, okay. So, so the people who wrote Revelations didn't want the authorities to know that they were mocking or talking about Nero in a bad way. Oh, Okay. So that's the the theory you like the most. Is that the most popular theory? I've never heard of any other. I don't know if it's the most popular. I mean, I honestly don't know. But there's another view of the Mark of the Beast being somehow related to the rise of a supranational currency. So a a currency that goes across borders. Mm -hmm. So like the euro or I was thinking Bitcoin. (laughs) (laughs) People who believe this version of the Mark of the Beast um, believe that Revelation addresses the second coming of Jesus. And so if we see these these patterns come up, like a a particular kind of currency, then the second coming is is coming. Mm -hmm. Now that might be the most popular version because I don't, but I don't know. Yeah. So people avoid it just like they avoid... um, Friday the 13th or the 13th floor, right? So uh, apparently in 1989, Nancy and Ronald Reagan were moving to their home in Bel Air, which is in a like fancy part of Los Angeles. And uh, the address of this new house was 666 uh, St. Cloud Road. So they changed it to 668 St. Cloud Road, (laughs) which (laughs) it's, I mean, this is kind of like for me, (laughs) removing a 13th floor. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same to me as well. You're still living on 666 St. Cloud Road. <laughs> well, I guess in this sense, it's a little different because the numbers aren't perfect. Like you don't have every single address on a, That's true. On a block. So it's a little less frivolous. And for them, it really mattered because not only were they very strong Christians, they also believed in, um, what do you call it? Psychics. They believed in psychics. Oh. This stuff was really d- up their alley. So I'm not surprised they changed the n- the number. I didn't know they believed in psychics. That is so oh, yeah. California of them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Especially Nancy, as, as far as I recall. Oh, wow. Okay. And then in New Mexico, I didn't even know there was a Route 666. Yeah. And it was changed in 2003 to Route 491. <laughs> And a New Mexico spokesperson apparently said, the devil's out of here, and we say goodbye and good riddance. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. (laughs) And this was in 2003. Okay. Not that long ago. (laughs) Yep. It could have been like 1803, honestly. (laughs) Right. I mean, to me, it's just one of the most silly things we could possibly do, but. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, (laughs) So I really like this one. A lot. Uh, most semiconductor processors produced in the early days of um, uh, personal computers also avoided 666. So uh, while being a progressive stage in the development of processor speed, many processors, such as uh, Intel Pentium 3, were clocked at 667 megahertz instead of 666 megahertz, which would have been the natural megahertz that we should... <laughs> megahertz <laughs> I just plural the plural, didn't I? <laughs> Hertz is not plural. Okay, so how do you plural it? Because I was like, it's just with a number, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you don't pluralize it. Okay. Because it's a, it, it, I don't know why you don't, but you don't. Maybe because it ends in an S, so we just don't pluralize it. Yeah. And then one more. Mm-hmm. Apparently, Joe Barton, the U.S. representative in 2015, so again, very recently, <laughs> had introduced a legislative bill and he had the, had the number change from 666 to 702. <laughs> Oh, I don't know how number how uh, legislative bills are numbered, but that seems... I thought they were sequential. Right, so that's quite the skip of numbers. Well, my guess is that other people have oh, introduced yeah. other bills in between. Yeah, good point. So we all survived Friday the 13th, and so did everyone on Flight 666 to hell. <laughs> as- to hell. <laughs> as far as I know, right? They're okay. <laughs> Yeah, they're okay. okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, all, they all made it to Helsinki. Everything's fine. <laughs> all right. Um, so when I was thinking about this episode, I was trying to think of the things that scared me as a child. And uh, one of the things was the legend of Bloody Mary. Um, and it kind of has to do with language. It's kind of like, you know, kind of like an incantation or like a divination of, of something, right, by using words. So like bringing her about. So the the way that I grew up, you were supposed to look into a mirror and the lights were supposed to be out and you're supposed to say Bloody Mary three times. And it would bring about this bloody woman that was like really scary looking and- uh, Like Carrie. Yeah, because she was like covered in blood. For me, we would just see her. That's what I knew the legend to be. But for some people, um, they said that she would actually come out of the mirror or that like you would have scratch marks on you because she would come out and scratch you. Oh, God. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I'm really glad we weren't that like... Horror. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So the most popular version of who Bloody Mary is, is that she is... Um, Queen Mary the First of England, the daughter of um, um, Henry the Eighth, Henry Eighth and Aragon, <laughs> Cat- Catherine Aragon, Catherine of Aragon. Sorry, Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. So, if you um, believe that Bloody Mary is actually um, Queen Mary of England, then your version of Bloody Mary might also involve saying, "I have your child," and that's because. Um, According to legend, actually, this is true, right? She really wanted to have a child because people want to have heirs mm-hmm. to their to the throne, and she had like two false pregnancies and a lot of miscarriages, so she never got the heir. So some dicks were like, "Let's just, you know, the, the Bloody Mary legend is going to, you know, be like we're going to taunt her and say that we have our child." So mm. some people may have that version where they say that I have your child. And she's called Bloody Mary because she was, like, all about beheading Protestants. 
right? Uh, so. I thought she burned them at the stake. Oh, really? Well, that's the version I read. Let me see. I thought that's where the blood came from. It's like decapitation. This is, this is from Wikipedia. During her five-year uh-huh. reign, Mary had over 280 religious dissenters burned at the stake. Oh, okay. But, that's, but, they, wow. were, but they were Protestants, and they, the Protestants did denounce her as Bloody Mary as a result. Okay. But yeah, yeah. it's it's interesting because, yeah, the, when you think of burning, it's not that bloody. Mm-mm. Although I guess it's like more symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the reason why Bloody Mary or this whole idea of looking into the mirror and conjuring this woman um, and saying Bloody Mary is because of Queen Mary of England. But uh, there's also stories that say that this originated in, let me see, can I say it? Cato... <laughs> Cato... Potromancy. How do you say that? Cat top Trump. Trump. I don't know. Let me look at it. <laughs> On the Wikipedia, it doesn't have the pronunciation. Well, Cat- there's a Merriam-Webster Webster version, so hopefully it will. Catropmancy. Oh, it doesn't have the stress process properly. Oh yeah, yeah. Where's the main stress? Yeah, I know. Catoptromancy. Catrop. Catoptromancy. Catoptromancy. <laughs> So catoptroman, so um, this may have originally started as a form of catoptromancy, which is divination through mirrors. And um, young women used to walk backwards upstairs with a candle in one hand and a handheld mirror in the other. And then what was supposed to appear in the mirror was the face of the man you were supposed to marry. And if the Grim Reaper showed up in the mirror, it meant that you were going to be dead before you could ever get married so this story uh this version it's just reminded me of like how many of those girls would like see the grim reaper and be like thank god i'm gonna die before i have to marry a man <laughs> but if you're that kind of woman are you the one, kind of type of woman who's going to be walking upstairs backwards with a mirror in your hand peer pressure you know they probably had slumber parties <laughs> <laughs> and every, everyone okay. was doing it okay <laughs> i don't know um <laughs> <laughs> so there's that version of, of it um and then there's also uh when i was thinking about this there's a japanese version that's kind of similar um so hanuk san was supposedly a world war ii era japanese girl who probably died in an air raid and she appears in bathrooms but to call her you must go to the third stall of the third floor bathroom and say are you there <laughs> hanuk san three times so there's also the three there saying it three mm-hmm. times, just like Bloody Mary. I don't know what that's about. Oh, three is also supposed to be a powerful number. So the the Trinity is related to the Trinity. And if you think okay. about folks, uh, fairy tales, a lot of them have three th- things happening. So like mm. Goldilocks and the three bears. Oh, yeah. And then the three uh, wolves, bad wolves, or the three little pigs. Three little pigs, yeah. Mm-hmm. So in, in European folk tales, three is a very powerful number probably related to the trinity maybe maybe it's older than that Mm -hmm. in north america the most powerful number was often four so things happen four times in oh okay yeah oh so like in um indigenous uh folk tales yeah you mean okay um and then another one that reminded me of um bloody mary if we're talking about uh, queen mary is la llorona uh, which is a mexican um folk story about a woman who supposedly was just so upset because her handsome husband cheated on her with someone younger and so she decided to um drown her children in a river (laughs) um so i just like uh, i thought of mary these poor women (laughs) that like you know, Mary wanted to be a mother and La Llorona was apparently a terrible mother. And like this idea that women that are not successful at being mothers come back and haunt, haunt us is just so terrible. Yeah. So I didn't actually grow up with La Llorona because I didn't live by a river, but I did grow up with La Chupracaba because <laughs> I live by fields. Um, but he doesn't have to do with anything with words. He's just a blood sucking goat killer. <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, Bloody Mary. I can say Bloody Mary in the mirror three times now, but I could not when I was eight. Yeah, I couldn't either. I was terrified. I was. It doesn't make any sense, but I was scared of everything. I mean, I was scared of Friday the 13th when I was at age two. Yeah, I mean, all the movies. <laughs> it the wasn't movie even about series. the movies because I refused to watch them. Yeah, I don't know why. I just, I took it seriously. 
I, I think there was a lot of peer pressure to take it seriously too. My friends were so afraid. So I was like, well, I, might, I should be afraid too. <laughs> All right. So that kind of naturally leads into the witch hunt idea. So, right. Because uh, we were talking about maybe a witch was burned at the stake and that's why Bloody Mary. Is that, did we say that? No, sorry. So, and then one other version of Bloody Mary, apparently a lady named Mary Worth was um, burned at the stake for being a witch. And they think that she was actually Bloody Mary. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> she was a witch. She did <laughs> practice witchcraft. She did? How do you know that? Because witches aren't real, so... <laughs> We have found the witch. May we burn her? Burn her! Who do you know she is a witch? She looks like one. Yeah, she looks like one. Bring her forward. Did she think she was a witch? Yes, sorry. Um, so, she thought she was a witch? Yeah. Okay. So there's one version of the story where um, Bloody Mary is actually the ghost of a woman who believed she was a witch named Mary Worth because Mary Worth practiced the dark arts. <laughs> Hmm. So, yes. Um, not in, she was like a real motherfucker because she would like um, do ritualistic sacrifices of runaway slaves. Oh, so, oh, okay. Yeah. She was not great. I mean, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, we, we probably should have punished her for doing the ritualistic sacrifices of human beings and not, you know, yeah. the other little things. <laughs> yeah. The fact that she was a witch, which is not a real thing, is irrelevant. I mean, I know there are witches like in the Wiccan sense, but we're, I'm talking about witches mm-hmm. in terms of like actual literal uh, magical power. <laughs> right. I mean, right, maybe right, right. you believe in them, but I don't. So, yeah. So yeah. that naturally le- leads us into the idea of a witch hunt. So witch hunts is a, a witch hunt is a search for people who are labeled witches or even just evidence of witchcraft at, at all. And it usually involves something like moral panic, which is like a fear of a feeling of fear spreading throughout a population you think that there's some evil in your society and it threatens your society Um, and examples of that are things like satanism or the war on drugs Mm -hmm. or it involves mass hysteria which is kind of related but a little bit different so you everyone thinks that they are a witch or everyone thinks that they are sick Mm -hmm. Um, so the classical period when we think of witch hunts we normally think of uh, europe and north america from around 1450 to 1750 that was like the classic time when we were burning witches. Mm -hmm. And apparently 35,000 to 100,000 people were killed. Obviously, mostly women, because that's who we're most afraid of. Right. Um, And and the last executions of people convicted as witches in Europe was in the 18th century. But there are still current contemporary witch hunts, uh, reported at least, in sub-Saharan Africa and Papua New Guinea. And there's actual uh, legislation against witchcraft in Saudi Arabia and Cameroon. Oh, wow. So people still take it seriously. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I knew that, but I'd forgotten yeah. <laughs> when, when I was doing the research yeah. for this. And as expected, no matter what, if we're talking about in the past or we're talking about currently, most of the accused are women or children. Mm-hmm. So vulnerable, more vulnerable people. Right. But they also can be elderly people or j- marginalized com- groups of the community. Again, vulnerable mm-hmm. people. Um, so these these victims are often considered to be burdens. And I think that's how they justify killing them. Right. Oh, they're burdens and they're right. evil. Or they're, or they're evil because they're burdens somehow. Um, so... <laughs> I, it really upsets me when people use witch hunt incorrectly. So, and it's often by men, so people who are in mm-hmm. power. Well, I respect the move, but the entire thing has been a witch hunt, and uh, there is no collusion between certainly myself and my campaign. So, for example, right now, um, men, more men are being accused of sexual assault, uh, like Weinstein, um, and men are saying this is a witch hunt. We're looking from other cases. Yeah. And I like this tweet from Sarah Lerner who says, the only men who earnestly use the phrase witch hunt are the ones afraid of actually being held accountable. (laughs) Which is like the opposite of what was happening in actual witch hunts, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, witch hunts are targeting people who uh, maybe are on the margins of society, but they're not doing anything usually. Right. Um, They just freak people out for no reason usually. Right. Yeah. yeah, so it's uh, ahistorical to be a white man in power and say he, um, you're subject to a witch hunt. Right. <laughs> and I, obviously other people have said this before us, but I just want to add to the... Yeah. Just don't say that. Yeah. Don't use it incorrectly. Yeah. <sighs> All right. I think the last thing we should talk about is the, the glamour. Yes. <laughs> 
you please talk about this. I have no idea. <laughs> Where did you find this? Someone tweeted it. <laughs> oh, right, right. You sent it. Okay, go on. <laughs> so I did, I, did, I did not know this before today, but glamour, the word glamour, um, for, first of all, is a Scottish English word, and it's related to grammar. So back in the medieval times, grammar used to mean any type of scholarship, but especially occult learning, because back then, if you were learning, you were also learning things that we would consider to be non-scientific, like astrology or alchemy. Mm -hmm. So at the, back in, the, in, those era, in that time, if you were a, a learned person, you were learning all kinds of things, including the occult. Mm -hmm. So at some point, grammar had a specialized meaning on top of the normal meaning of sort of, you know, what we think of as grammar now, learning how to read and write. Well, that's what it meant originally. So learning, learning how to read and write. But it also had this specialized meaning of occult learning. So it went from this path of reading and writing to occult to magic. Mm -hmm. So glamour meant magic or spell or magic and, or enchantment. And then from there, it, it, it took on this magical beauty or alluring charm by around 1840. So it, it took this interesting path to now we think of it as meaning like, you know, glamorous. Mm -hmm. um, but it originally meant magic. And before that, learnedness in general. So glamour is still used in a magic sense, like as a type of spell, making objects appear different. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly we think of like glamorous. Wow. That, I would have never known that. Me either. So thank you, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Twitter is a cesspool, but there's some cool stuff on there too. <laughs> yes, I agree. And related is the is grimoire, which probably also comes from the same meaning of grammar. So it's a book of, a grimoire is a book of instructions in the use of magic or alchemy, but especially used to summon demons. Um, oh. And it possibly also ha ha comes from uh, the word, a Frankish word, grima. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, so I'll just say grima, which meant mask or sorcerer. And that also is the word for, the origin of the word for grimace. Mm -hmm. Or it could come, it, or it could also come from the Italian word "rimario," which is "book of rhymes," but it melded with grammar. So either "book of rhymes" or "mask or sorcerer" coming together with grammar, and you got grimoire. So oh. I thought that was kind of fun. That is fun. <laughs> I will never think of glamour the same. No, way. me either. Yeah. Wait. So if we say glamorous, could it mean um, like that's magical? I don't think that's, I don't think anyone ever uses glamorous to mean like, like put the whammy on someone or something like that. Yeah. That's too bad. <laughs> Maybe we can make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> we can. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So the definition, according to dictionary.com, full of glamour, charmingly mm -hmm. or fascinatingly attractive, especially mm -hmm. in a mysterious or magical way. See, I've never looked up glamorous, and so I've never seen that. All right, so it's there. It's there. It's still kind of there. Yeah. All right. Okay. I just wanted to uh, give a little shout out <laughs> to Cote d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast, because for some reason, 5% of our listeners are from there, which <laughs> is kind of awesome and unexpected. Yeah. I love that. So thank you, Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> we, have, we have people from several different countries, right? Yes, but that was the largest of the non-English speaking countries. Okay. Because it's Francophone mainly. Yeah. Plus plus all the African languages spoken there as well. Yes. Yes. Very cool. All right. So I guess next time back to linguistic discrimination, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there'll definitely be actual literal discrimination <laughs> as opposed to well, there is discrimination in this, it's just it was yeah. language per se. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we can't escape it. <laughs> yeah. But I was hoping you enjoyed our Halloween episode. And thank you so much for listening. Yes. And, uh, you know, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Do not be an asshole. Bye. Bye. The Vocal Fries podcast is produced by Chris Ayers for Halftone Audio. Theme music by Nick Granham. You can find us on Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Vocal Fries Pod. You can email us at vocalfriespod at gmail.com. <laughs>